Do, 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 do. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to get started. I will begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day, and I thank you for this class and these students. Just ask you to bless our work today, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, um, today, I'm going to tell you guys about the Wedge product. And determinants. So, um... So the Wedge product is something a little bit different than any of the products I told you about last time. So the last time, all the algebras that I defined, I gave you the whole set and I showed you how to multiply things inside that set. So what's different about this is we're, we're going to look at, thank you, the, um, well, let me just introduce some notation for you. So, omega v, all right, it's going to be the direct sum, um, k equals zero to n of lambda sub k v, all right, and that's going to be, so what I mean by that is lambda zero v, um, direct sum lambda one v, direct sum lambda 2v, and so forth and so on, until we finally get to the lambda nv. So this is the so-called exterior algebra. Now here, lambda 0, v, is just the field itself. Lambda 1v is the vector space itself. All right? But the rest of these things, there's something new. All right? And <clears throat> I want to just kind of take a formal approach. Like, I don't want to actually construct them from anything. I just want to kind of tell you what these different spaces look like. So lambda 2v is things of the form, um, well, it's, let me write it this way. It's the span of, say, x wedge y, such that x and y are vectors. Lambda 3. V is the span of x wedge y wedge z, such that x, y, and z are vectors. I think you see where this is going. If we look at lambda kv, it's the span of x1 wedge da 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 wedge xk, such that x sub i is an element of v for all i 1 to k. Yep. The the yes. So <clears throat> these are the sets. So um, in terms of terminology, just to give us some like you know language here, uh, this would be like the set of two vectors. This would be the set of three vectors. These are k vectors. And we define the wedge product on the direct sum of all of these things. So what I'm saying is it's a little bit different than what we did last class in the sense that the thing we're trying to gain information about in some sense is v, but we're, we're adding things to v and uh, we're going to define a multiplication on these additional things. In that sense, it's exterior. So the wedge product um, has the following properties. So the wedge product is, it's a mapping um, from omega v to omega v again, all right? It takes k vectors to, you know, it takes sums of k vectors to sums of k vectors. So I'll describe it in terms of its properties. Like, Number one, if you had alpha plus beta wedge gamma, you got like alpha, alpha wedge gamma, 
uh, plus beta wedge gamma, for instance. It's, it's got this kind of linearity, right? Um, two, you can pull constants out. So if I had like, you know, alpha wedge, say a constant times beta, you could pull the constant out. All right, and you could do the same from the first entry. Um, it's an associative product. So if I have alpha, wedge beta, wedge gamma, it makes sense. All right, it's an associative product. Like that. So, so far, so like, uh, right? Like this is like most of our products. They were associative, they were linear in the sense, you know? Nothing terribly interesting here so far yet. But then this is where it gets interesting for um, x wedge y is equal to minus y wedge x for all x and y and v. By the, by the way, we're going to assume that f is either equal to the reals or the complexes for this lecture. <clears throat> I don't really have much experience with differential, excuse me, for, with a wedge product over other fields. Yep. Is this supposed to be the same thing? Hmm? Mm. It's true, but useless. True, but useless, much like most things on TV. Oh no, that does not true. I can't, I can't give it truth. Yeah, it doesn't apply to TV at all. Um, hmm. All right, I'll try to s stop searching for things to offend. But um, so this is this this basic anti-commutativity, and you can prove. And I probably should have made this a homework, but oh well, I didn't. That if you have alpha wedge beta, it's equal to minus one to the PQ beta wedge alpha if alpha is a, is a P vector and beta is a Q vector. So I'm going to make some claims here. And I guess I... Um, so my claim for you, uh, and I don't think, this is not proved in the notes, but you could, you could prove this. Um, if we look at beta um, k equal to, let us say, um, uh, e i 1 wedge um, e i 2 wedge e i k such that 1 is less than or equal to i1 is less than i2 is less than less than i k which is less than or equal to n um, this gives basis for lambda k um, v where v is the span of, you know, EI. Yeah? Mike, what is the wedge operator? I, I seem to remember it being vaguely mentioned at the end of last class, but I don't remember anything else about it. It is a operation with these properties. Okay, so it doesn't map. So it's just any operation with these properties. It's not a so in your homework, in the bonus homework, I give a specific way of implementing the wedge product as a, or I give you a way to create the wedge product for two-dimensional space. So um, let me come back to your question in about five minutes. Yeah? Okay. 
So um, this, this is a basis for lambda k. My question then is, like, how, if you believe me that this is a basis for lambda k, how many things are in there? You know? So <clears throat> let's focus on the case. We'll focus on v equals to rn. That's our principal interest, I think, here. I'm trying to remember if I have anything on, like, I mean, if you can do it for rn, you can do it for an abstract vector space just the same. Um, well, I'll focus on v equals rn just, just to make it less weird for you guys, at least for now, yeah? Um, so let me just kind of run down here. So for lambda 0, um, rn, that's just the span of 1. For lambda 1 rn, that's rn. So we know how that works, right? Lambda 2 rn, my claim to you is that a basis for that is ei wedge ej um, such that 1 is less than or equal to i less than j less than or equal to n. <coughs> and this goes on. So like lambda n, rn is actually the span if you, E1, wedge E2, wedge da da da, wedge En. See, there's only one way to choose N indices distinctly from N such that they're increasing. That's it. If I have any repeat, if I had any repeat in the, in the list, I'd get zero. <coughs> so, like, let me, let me make it, let me take it down to earth here a bit more. Let's try N equals to 2. How about that? So we've, we're, we're going to look at, you know, what's the exterior algebra of R2? So lambda 0, R2 is just R. Lambda 1, R2 is just R2. Lambda 2, which by the way is the span of E1 and E2. Lambda 2, R2 is the span of E1 and E2. So notice that the dimension um, of the exterior algebra for two dimensions is 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1, also known as 4. So I have a homework problem, which I was getting to, Joshua, is <laughs> in the homework, I actually let you find specific sets of 4 by 4 matrices which implement this algebra. You find a matrix for E1, you find a matrix for E2, and when you multiply those two matrices, you get the matrix for E1 wedge E2. However, if you multiply the matrices for E2 and the matrix for E1 in the opposite order, you get minus the matrix for E1 wedge E2. So like I show how to build the wedge product in terms of 4 by 4 matrices. But we don't want to think about the wedge product in 4 by 4 matrices. We want to think about it sort of abstractly as, a, as something that we can do to vectors. Yeah? Can the dimension be 6? Why? You wrote 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1 equals 4. Oh, yeah. What did I do wrong, though? So these two were the same two. Um, so how do I fix that? I guess I just erased one of them. So. <laughs> One, two, three. <coughs> <coughs> Great. So, so n equals three. <laughs> n equals three. You have, <coughs> you know, you've got one, and then you've got e1, e2, e3. Then you've got, you say, e1 wedge e2, e1 wedge e3, e2 wedge e3. And then you've got E1, wedge E2, wedge E3. There's your k equals to 0, k equals to 1, k equals to 2, and k equals to 3.
all right? I mean, those are the basic building blocks of the exterior algebra um, for three dimensions. So like the dimension of the exterior algebra for R3 <coughs> would be 1 plus 3 plus 3. I really mean it this time, um, plus 1, which is 8. It does. Right, so you can prove that generically speaking, the dimension of k forms on Rn is n choose k. So the dimension of the exterior algebra on Rn is the sum k equals 0 to n of n choose k, which you should recognize as 1 plus 1 to the n power, also known as 2 to the n. So the dimension of the exterior algebra is exactly 2 to the n. For a two-dimensional space, the exterior algebra is four-dimensional. For a three-dimensional space, the exterior algebra is eight-dimensional. And so it goes. So this is a newfangled algebra we can build for a vector space, and it's going to give us all kinds of insight into the linear dependence and independence of vectors. All right, we'll see this. But it also gives us a way to define the determinant algebraically. We can use this algebra to define the determinant. So let's work out a calculation to kind of show you where we're going with that. So I'm going to work out this um, example here. What would happen if I do, you know, um, AE1 plus BE2 wedged with CE1 plus DE2. So I just use the rules of the wedge product. So I get AC, E1 wedge E1, plus AD, E1 wedge E2, plus BC, E2 wedge E1, plus BD, E2 wedge E2. All right? Now, I told you, foundationally, the wedge product of any vector with itself is minus itself. What does that mean, though? Well, I, didn't I didn't tell you this yet, did I? But we had this as an axiom, right? x wedge y is minus y wedge x for all x in the vector space. So what's to say about x with itself? The wedge product of x with itself. Zero. That's right. So if we have any repeat, we get 0. I said that. I meant to derive it. I'm sorry. I'm sick. I'm not entirely myself at the moment. Or maybe I'm exactly myself. I don't know. But <clears throat> however you'd like to blame me, feel free. But <clears throat> the point here is that two of these things are zero. And we're left with AD minus BC, E1 wedge E2. If I look at the matrix, A equals to, you know, A, B, C, D like this, what we have here is that A times E1 wedge A times E2 is the determinant of A times E1 wedge E2. Assuming you remember determinant from Math 221, I am going to prove such a thing exists and define it uniquely from the wedge product in here, though. All right, but you do know the determinant of a 2 by 2, I know. We haven't forgotten that. It is not so far in vogue to claim forgetfulness on this point. I mean, you guys will claim forgetfulness on other points, but not this one, right? Not if you know what's good for you, because this is a super useful, isn't it? Like the, the determinant, anyway. All right? This is not an accident, and this, actu this actually is going to be our definition once I have things set up in, 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 in their proper order. We're going to define the determinant to be the number that appears here 
when you take the wedge product, let me just write out. So here's going to be our definition. Our definition for the determinant, once I put everything in order, is going to be like if you take a wedge a AE1, wedge AE2, wedge da da da, wedge AEN, that it's the unique number that appears here, and you've got the standard basis wedged afterwards. This implicitly defines the determinant. So now in my notes, I work out the um, n equals three case, I think shortly thereafter this calculation. But I think I'm going to resist the urge to do that because that would burn a lot of class time and we wouldn't get much out of it. But it's in the notes on page 139 to 140. I straight up work out the 3 by 3 case and show you the determinant for the 3 by 3 comes from a very similar calculation. All right, these are motivating examples. <coughs> then, at this point in the notes, I go back and I give you the abstract definition of the exterior algebra on page 140 on section 4.2.3. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to break from the notes here for a minute <coughs> and talk to you some about your homework because I put some of the most interesting things in your homework rather than here. By the way, if instead of, before I erase all this, let me just take advantage of the time. If you put a, if you put a, a, um, a dual space up here, then instead of calling these k vectors, they're called forms. And so like, um, this is the set of k forms. So k forms are formed by the wedge product of k dual vectors. And if you, so you guys know the difference between a vector field and a vector, right? A vector field is something we define on a space, right? It's an attachment of a vector at each point on the space. You could talk about a vector field along a curve, attach a vector to each point on a curve, right? Or talk about a vector field on a surface, attach a vector to each point on the surface. You could talk about a vector field in all of R3. It's attaching a vector at each point in R3, right? So we can make a distinction between vector fields and vectors in the same way K-forms well, you can think about attaching a k-form at each point in space. And if you do that, it's called a differential k-form. In fact, often when people talk about a k-form, they're talking about a differential k-form, which is essentially a k-form field. So the generalization of vector fields to k-forms is, is what actually physicists are often interested in. Much of modern physics, like string theory, stuff like that, is written in terms of differential k-forms. All right, I shut up. Let me erase this here. So, <clears throat> in your homework, I show you, because there's a natural question to ask here, which is, this, what does this look like? Does it look like anything? What has properties like this? The what? Just like the normal properties of arithmetic. Yeah, but, I mean, I mean, how about this one here? What, what's like this? The cross product, right? So you guys know the deal? V cross W is equal to minus W cross V, right? And it also has the linearity property, right? So is this just the cross product? Well, it's not, right? Because the cross product of two vectors is again a what? Is it something new and fangled and is it a two vector? No, it's a vector again, right? And there's other thing about the cross product, which is this. If you have A cross B cross C, A equals to A cross B cross C, if you read this in a textbook, this means that your professor doesn't know what they're doing. It means that you should throw that book out because whoever wrote it doesn't care about math and so they're not worth listening to. Um, but <laughs> this must, <laughs> non-negotiable, because the, that's actually not true. Um, the point is that that's not true. The cross product is not associative. So you need parentheses. What is true, actually doesn't matter. That's for another course. But there is an identity you can write down. So it's not, so this is not the cross product. It's kind of like the cross product. Natural question to ask, how does this relate to the cross product? So here's the deal. 
in your homework, I introduce a couple things. One is the, the work form correspondence. So if we have omega a, b, c, um, I usually do a, d, x plus b, d, y plus c, d, z. And then I introduce a flux form correspondence. Um, a dy wedge dz plus b dz wedge dx plus c dx wedge dy. So this is the, the work form correspondence and the flux form correspondence. I suppose to be fussy, these, is, these are, one, it's a one form and it's a two form. And, um, and I could denote this instead as like omega, let's say v vector, and this would be the phi sub v vector. Yep. Just a notation for us, but um, I'm just I'm choosing to denote the dual space to R3 as the span of dx, dy, and dz. Um, just a choice of notation for me. We're not thinking about them operationally in here. There is much more to say about that in a different course. <coughs> so if you want me to talk about that, I would talk about it, for example, in like differential calculus or, I mean, advanced calculus or another course. But for here, just a notation. If you'd rather, you could use E upper 1, E upper 2, E upper 3. That's what I mean by them. So like, anyway, so <clears throat> that actually doesn't matter for the homework problems I've asked you, because all I think I asked you guys to show is this. One of the things you can show is if you have omega v wedge omega, let's say, um, I'll say v1 wedge v2, it turns out that that is the flux form of the cross product of v1 and v2. So the wedge product picks up the cross product at the level of wedge products in that way. And there's also, if you do the triple wedge, which I'll do a, wedge B, wedge C, that turns out to be A dot B cross C, dx wedge dy wedge dz. So there's even a dot product. There's even a dot product that's hidden in this here exterior algebra. So the wedge product will automatically fold in the cross product and even the dot product if we look at the appropriate wedging. So it's got, it has all of the ingredients of the vector algebra that you learn in Calculus 3. It's all in there. It's just at different levels. So pragmatically speaking, I wouldn't teach Calc 3 with this entirely because it's kind of a pain to get my, my paws on the dot product in terms of the wedge product, right? But it's in there. So anyway, this might make the wedge product feel a little bit less esoteric to you in terms of it does actually pick back up on three-dimensional cross product and dot product calculations. It also gives you an insight here. So in some sense, my presentation of the determinant for you this semester is grossly irresponsible. It's wrong. It's wrong-headed. It's emphasizing the wrong things, perhaps, because there is a certain cult of people who, with a religious devotion, declare that determinants are volume. And they're not wrong. Determinants are volume, which means that the wedge product is volume. That is very apparent in this formula right here. See, the wedge product of omega A, omega B, omega C is the triple product of A with B cross C. This is the volume of the parallel piped with side edges A, B, and C, the signed volume, right? If A, B, and C are a right-handed triple, that's positive. If A, B, and C are not, if the cross product of A and B does not go in the direction of C, that will be negative, according to responding to the fact that A, B, C is an evil left-handed triple. <clears throat> Literally evil, like a cat, cat-like, if this is negative. So <clears throat> anyway, there's all that. But the thing is, I can calculate the wedge product of vectors in three dimensions, in two dimensions. I can calculate it in seven dimensions. It doesn't matter. It's just, it keeps going and going and going. The other cool thing you'll see when you look at the notes is that when I calculate the wedge product um, for, you know, 
the three-dimensional case, you'll see that if you arrange the calculation differently, you discover the different expansions along the row or the column that you've been taught before. You can start to see why you'd get different row and column expansions if you study the formulas. So anyway, I just wanted to give you some sort of more general, this is why, part of the reason I think it's really interesting, um, but none of what I've just told you will help, you help us derive the theory of determinants, which is what we're after here today. So let's get back to it. Um, <coughs> So we have, two, we have two purposes. The one is to <coughs> develop the theory of determinants, and the other is to apply the wedge product to study linear dependence of vectors. So, because you think about it, how do we just study linear dependence of vectors? Let's, let's think about it. We have to look at that equation, right? C1, V1, da da da, plus CKVK equal to zero. Now you remember from 221, if you have n vectors, you can just do what? You can shove them in a determinant if they're n vectors, if they're n-dimensional, n, n dimensional vectors, you know, put them in the determinant, if the determinant's zero, yay, linear dependent, right? But you can't, you couldn't do it with less than n. With the, reg, with, with the wedge product, what we're going to learn is that if we have a set of k vectors and we take the wedge product of them <coughs> and it's zero, it is necessary that they're linearly dependent. And we can do that whether we're talking about two vectors or three vectors, any number of vectors less than the dimension of the space, we can still do it. And for more vectors than the dimension of the space, it's automatically the case that the wedge product is zero, which corresponds to the necessary linear dependence of more than n vectors. All of these things will be automatically folded into the wedge product algebra. So I think it's worth it. Um, so let's work on the definition of determinant. <laughs> And I'm not stating it yet. First, I have to state something that mathematicians sometimes grimace at because I don't know why. What's wrong with mathematicians? Definition, lazy punks. Um, epsilon i1, i2, da da da, in is the completely anti symmetric symbol. which is defined um, to be anti-symmetric in any exchange of indices and epsilon 1, 2, three da 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 n is defined to be one. So let's write it out. I'll write it out for n equals to two and n equals two you got epsilon one two is equal to one. And that's equal to minus epsilon two one. What else do you have? Get rid of this evil, invisible marker. What's epsilon one one? What's epsilon two two? Those are both zero because they're equal to minus themselves. If you exchange one and one or exchange two and two, you're right back where you started with a minus, so these must be zero. N equals to three. We have epsilon one, two, three equals to one. That's also equal to epsilon um, two, three, one, which is also equal to epsilon three, one, two. <coughs> On the other hand, epsilon three, two, one is equal to minus one, and that is also equal to epsilon two, one, three, which is epsilon equal to epsilon one, three, two. If you're wondering how I write those down, I start with one, two, three, and I cyclically exchange the numbers. Think about taking the number one, two, three, and I push it over like this. Do, 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 do. As I push it over, the one goes back to the other side. See that? Like I take this three and I, I push it over like that. So these two threes, see that? These two three goes here. And then this one, this three one becomes that three one and the two pushes over. Three, two, one is minus one. 
And if you think about it, um, this 2, 1 pushes to that 2, 1, and this 1, 3 pushes to that 1, 3. And the, you see how the, that's the pattern. Of course, you can derive it because to get from 1, 2, 3 to um, 3, 2, 1, what do you do? You just exchange the 1 and 3, right? Flip, which is why we have minus 1. I can get from 1, 2, 3 to epsilon 2, 1, 3 by doing what? By flipping 1 and 2. Boop, that's why I got minus 1. To get from here to there, I flip the last two. Boop, that's why I got this minus 1. These, on the other hand, to get from here to here, I need two flips. Yep. Why did 1, 2, 3 get 1, so I get 1? Why did what? The definition is that epsilon 1, 2, 3, n is 1. So it was born that way, to quote the great Lady Gaga. I'm sorry, I've brought Lady Gaga into this. I'm so sorry. I, you weren't expecting that. You weren't expecting, no one was expecting that. Now, of course, we also have that epsilon um, ijk is equal to 0 if any i, j, k is repeat. <coughs> you know, for, just to be clear here, repeats. Right, so like, you know, epsilon 1, 1, 2, or epsilon 1, 1, 1, or epsilon 2, 2, 3, et cetera, et cetera. Don't make me write them all out. How many are there? You have three indices, they take three values, that's 3 times 3 times 3, also known as 27. So you have six non-trivial values and 21 non-trivial, non, uh, zero values, yeah. You could just write them with three forms, E, I, K, I, K, I. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very good, yeah. But then, of course, I've got, well, I think there's four of those. Because you've got, like, I, I, K, I, K, I. KII, -I, and then III. -I -I. Who cares? Um, I'm sorry. Uh, fun fact, and this was going to be a homework, but I forgot to write it. There's a, for, there's a stone cold formula for the cross product. Check it out, yo. A cross B is the sum I, J, K, um, epsilon, I, J, K, A sub I, B sub J. Um, e sub k. There you go. That is a formula for the cross product using the anti-symmetric symbol. If you want it. There it is. I didn't learn this until grad school. And I learned it a kind of painful way. I was doing a page and page, page after page after page of algebra. And then I talked to my friend Jorge and he's like, oh yeah, that one was, that was interesting. It was I was like, yeah, that was really hard. He's like, what? No, that was an easy problem. And I was like, what? And then he's like, well, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wait a minute, what? You did what? What's this? And so he was using this formula, and it made everything, like, super easy. Whereas I was not using this formula, because I was taught out of a typical American calculus textbook, which doesn't see this formula, because it doesn't know this formula, because it was written by ignorant mathematicians who don't know these things. So, um, sorry, but it's true. Physicists know more of this kind of math than mathematicians typically do. Sad but true. So <clears throat> anyway, have I made my case what this thing is? Do you guys? So <clears throat> fundamental lemma that we should prove. <coughs> oh, man. So essentially, this, this anti-symmetric symbol, it allows us to, I mean, the anti-symmetric symbol is nearly the wedge product in some sense. I mean, it's like, in some sense, it is the determinant. Um, mm. Anyway, this, this lemma is mission critical. And here it goes. If you have EJ1 wedge, E, J, 2, wedge, da, 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 wedge, E, 
Jn, we can rewrite that as simply epsilon. Um, J1, J2, that's the Jn, times E1 wedge E2 wedge En. So how's the proof go? The proof is essentially combinatorial. <sighs> um, so if we have repeated, you know, index, right, like a j sub i equal to j sub k, where i not equal to k, then what? Then the left hand side is equal to zero and the right hand side is equal to zero. Why? For the left hand side, we can basically commute them, right, with adding minuses for each time we swap until we get them adjacent. Basically, we can bring these two so they're next to each other and then when we take the wedge product of the same vector with itself, zero. And by the way, zero wedged with anything else is zero. That's, you could, that follows from the linearity of the wedge product. I haven't proved it, but it's true. Zero wedge anything is zero. Um, so on the flip side over here, by definition of the anti-symmetric symbol, right? If any of these indices is repeated, it's zero. So left hand is zero, right hand is zero. So my next argument <coughs> is that if J1 through Jn are in fact distinct, then <coughs> think about it this way. So if they're not repeated, then if J1, um, J2, da, 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 Jn distinct, right, then um, as a set, It is this. I'm not, I'm not saying ordered list. I'm saying that, you know, they have to be the same set of numbers if they're not repeated. And there's n of them, right? And I, I guess I should be clear here. <coughs> I mean, okay, context. We are assuming my bad, I should, t I should say this at the start. We're assuming one is less than or equal to J1, Jn, which is less than or equal to n. We are assuming that these indices are, are taken from the set of one through n. Without that, I couldn't make progress here, that's true. Because without that, there are many different choices possible, right? Like if I was working with more than these n indices, there's no reason that rearranging these should just get me to the first n. It could involve like the n plus one-th one and the n plus two-th one and so forth and so on, you know? It is important that I know this. But if they are distinct and they're taken from one through n, then logically speaking, they must be exactly one through n, right? And so then the question is, if you have to rearrange this to get to that, how do you do that? <coughs> so, what I said is, <coughs> if the net number of swaps is even, then you can argue that, <coughs> so in other words, you can get from, from here to here as ordered list, um, uh, I don't have a good notation for it. Well, I'll read what I said here. I said, if the net number of swaps is even, then the anti-symmetric symbol is one. And so we just have equality. On the other hand, if the net number of swaps is odd, then the anti-symmetric symbol is minus one and we get minus, um, we get a minus one. The point is that the, the real point is just this. 
is that the um, anti-symmetry of this, the, the indices here is the same as the anti-symmetry of the wedge product, and that's why these are equal. Essentially, that's the point. So for, let me just give you an example. So if I have like E4 wedge, E2 wedge, E1 wedge, E3, right? To get this over to there, I do, I do, you know, I move it two spots, right? So that's E1, wedge E4, wedge E2, wedge E3. See, I, since I moved it one and then two, I get a minus one for each swap, so I get a net plus. And then, let's see here, so to flip these two, I get a minus. All right. And then, oh, but these aren't in the right order yet. So right, so then I get a minus, a minus is plus. E1, wedge E2, wedge E3, wedge E4. But if you think about epsilon 4, 2, 1, 3, it's the same story, see? Because this is epsilon 1, 4, 2, 3, which is equal to minus epsilon <coughs> um, 1, 2, 4, 3, which is equal to minus a minus epsilon 1, 2, 3, 4, which, by the way, is 1. So my point is that the anti-symmetric symbol generates pluses and minuses in the same way that the wedge product generates pluses and minuses, and that's why the lemma is true, essentially. Also, it matches up when they're all arranged. I mean, essentially the proof is if, if you put E1, wedge E2, wedge da da da, wedge, En, well, of course, that's equal to epsilon 1, 2, 3, all the way out to n, right? Maybe this is a more convincing proof for you. This is true because that's defined to be 1. And whatever I permute over here, I generate a minus sign in the same way if I permute these indices over here. So they have the same properties. Like if I switch 1 and 2, I get a minus. If I switch 1 and 2, I get a minus, and so forth. So it stands to reason that we have this <coughs> equality. If that's not convincing, I'm sorry. I wish I could find a more convincing way to, to prove it, but that's, that's what I have for you today. <clears throat> oh, cool. I still got time. So that brings us to the next uh, proposition. <coughs> Um, so my next proposition is if V1 through Vn are n vectors in Fn, then there exists a unique D in the field for which V1 wedge all the way out through Vn is D times E1 wedged all the way through Vn. And we can work it out. So V1 wedge Vn is equal to the sum over, let's say, J1 of A um, J sub 1, 1, Ej1 wedged with the sum J2, Aj2, 2, Ej2 wedged the sum over Jn. Now I know I'm numbering my my I'm numbering my constants in kind of a weird way, aren't I? But there's a reason for it because I want to get something out of this calculation. <coughs> so using linearity of the wedge product, I've got the sum over J1, sum over J2 sum over Jn, A, J1, 1, A, J sub 2, 2, 
all the way on out, A J sub N N. And then I've got this E J one wedge E J two wedge dot dot wedge E J N. But by the lemma, that's exactly what? Right? I can trade this for this and that by the lemma. And we're done. Because this right here, we identify as the D. <clears throat> it's unique because I gave you a formula for it. And the choice of coordinates for V1 through Vn, which are encapsulated by the A, you know, A sub J, K, K, those are unique for each vector, right? Because the standard basis is a basis. And so what I put in the box is a unique constant that appears there. But what is, why did I make, why did I, what did I do? I mean, this is the determinant of like, you know, A. <laughs> See, column, column J, well, column K of A is like A sub what? A sub um, J, K, K. The K is fixed on the column, but the J sub K varies from 1 to N for an N by N. In other words, this, I've constructed this to be the jth, this is the jth column of the matrix, this is the second column, or the j sub 2 column. Well, I mean the A, to be more specific, this is, my A is, is V1, V2, da, da, V, um, Vn, there you go, that's, that's perhaps more, more what I'm trying to say here. <clears throat> so there, there is a unique number which appears from the wedge product of n things. And because of that, I can use that to define the determinant by this formula. I take, the, like I, I, I wrote over there earlier, but the wedge product of the columns of the matrix in their order 1 through n is equal to the determinant of the matrix times the wedge product of the standard basis. This we can use to uniquely define the determinant, yeah. So in the formula, what does the AJ1 mean? <sighs> um, it means I'm not done writing. So 1, 2, n. Thank you. Excellent question. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> Sorry about that. My question, my, my follow-up question is like, does this look anything like the definition of determinant you were given in 221? I would say not even remotely, right? Do you remember proving the determinant of the product is the product of the determinants in 221? Think so? I didn't. The proof for that in 221 lingo involves elementary matrix chasing. It's a very technical identity for us. We'll prove it in about five minutes of algebra because we've taken this approach. You'll see it next time. So anyway, that's it for today. Thank you for your homeworks. If you haven't given it to me, please give them to me. <laughs>